On the back, hope you had a lovely lunch break. Um, I mean, we're very excited to have you with us and hope you feel similar. Um, in the second, speculative fiction and speculative economics are two people who come from different fields, but both are very highly invested in interdisciplinary and in questions of sustainability. Our shared geography is a bunch of resources, and one of the things to try to be socially and sociologically towards. Uh, imagining how we can design our future possibility. We will have first of our uh, presentation and then it will be followed by Amal's uh, presentation. So the conversation will be uh, moderated by Neville, and now I invite Neville to come to the stage. Great, thank you very much. I want to thank, especially thank uh, Theo, Janat, Evan, and everyone at Design Contemporary for hosting this brilliant event. And, 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 and it's a pleasure to meet you today. And I want to start building on yesterday's and today's discussion, uh, which presented a range of different visions uh, for transition and young growth, uh, both from the global north with uh, notions of deep growth and economy, but also with perspectives from the global south, uh, with, with post development transitions to post extractivism and so on and so forth. And one of the key things is, was the, the key turn uh, towards you know, framing the economy as a site for intervention. And I'm really, really happy to be introducing this panel uh, titled Speculative Fiction, Speculative Economics, which uh, signals this turn um, towards speculation, fiction, and the economy as sites for critical activation. So I'm delighted to introduce our two speakers today, Bahar Nirizadeh and Emma Josephine B. Johnson. The first speaker, Bahar Nirizadeh, is an artist, writer, and filmmaker. Her research examines the historical advance of speculative activity and its derivative politics in art, urban life, finance, and economics. Bahar is a PhD candidate in art, Goldsmiths University of London, and her work has appeared at the German Pavilion, Venice Architecture Biennial, Take Modern Artists in the program, Transmedia Festival, among many others. Bahar is the founder of Weird Economies, an online art platform that traces economic imaginaries, extraordinary financial arrangements of our time. Bahar will present the project um, and elaborate a bit on financial activism. Our second speaker is Eamon Josephine B. Johnston, who is a scholar, speculative writer, artist, and pleasure activist whose work navigates intimate explorations of race, art, ecology, and feminism. Emma is a PhD candidate in psych social studies at Fairfax University of London, curatorial fellow with Frank Contemporary Art Finland and then International Limerick, and was a 2020-2021 Keith Haring Fellow in Art and Activism at Bard College New York. Emma's research takes a queer and colonial approach to speculating and archiving independent, pleasurable, like climate change, futures in Ghana and across the black diaspora. Her wider practice thinks through sustainable economies and economy of care and survival for uh, BIPOC women in the arts and academia. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our speakers and I give the floor to Bob. Hello and thanks for the invitation and I'm Theo, everyone who worked on the symposium. And happy spring equinox. It's the uh, Noru's uh, celebration today, the first day of spring, which actually is very relevant to the theme today. So I'm just gonna talk, maybe we can have weird economies on page or background too. Um, I'm just gonna talk through some um, conceptual ideas uh, that uh, is underlying weird economies, mainly the concept of the weird, um, which I've been developing over the past few years through um, reading many other theories, practitioners, activists, organizers who've been um, dealing with, uh, you know, either quite literally with the concept of the weird or I kind of try to frame their work as here, yeah, but uh, admittedly, um, I have to um, maybe set the tone in advance when we 
uh, pretty abstract and conceptual the discussion. Um, so, um, weird economies uh, is a post disciplinary experimental site and a knowledge platform focused on unorthodox and radical economic practices. And um, I will discuss three ways in which finance capitalism and the debt regime are weird. Um, in keeping with the three wayward or weird sisters in Macbeth, which is actually one of the original places where like, the word weird kind of appears. Um, understanding the weird temporalities and agencies animating finance helps to locate derivative politics and modes of financial activism that are separate from or take advantage of instruments currently in the service of predatory practices of future extraction. Ultimately, this presentation attempts to weave in Randy Martin's notion of mutual indebtedness into the unpayable debts of past historical injustice as one way of leveraging a viable mode of interaction with debt, of risking and taking on a social debt. If, as Kate Sauter writes, a degrowth understanding committed to social justice and a fairer distribution of environmental resources requires a more complex narrative on the old new divide, a transcendence of the current binary opposition between uncritical progressivism and elegant nostalgia, this presentation would offer the weird as a techno-conceptual device and weirding as a procedure to reinsert justice back into our economy, which is something that I think Catherine was kind of um, hinting towards also with her practice. Um, so, without further ado, one, um, so out of the three, three ways that I want to put forward. One, Mark Fisher describes the allure of the weird and the eerie to be a fascination for the outside. Over the course of modernism, two entities become the perfect reference for a fascination with the outside of time, finance and art. Economics in the past couple of centuries has embarked on a perverse quest to capture and control this exteriority. At the frontiers of the Enlightenment subject's Promethean project that seeks to capture and seize everything is the colonization of realms beyond the present. The question of time at the center of economic information was augmented in Hayek's later work until it reached its occult status. It was not knowledge, but the absence of knowledge, the ontological impossibility of accessing this knowledge in advance that underlies economic activity. The Hayekian knowledge, non-knowledge dichotomy then, making a transition from the realm of epistemology to ontology, was no more concerned with economic psychology as was previously theorized in the work of his antecedents. The economists who took this challenge to heart emerged primarily out of the Cal's Commission based at the University of Chicago. Cal's economists strongly opposed Hayek's cognitive theories and for the same reason were committed to overrule his metaphysics of the market with more enhanced information pragmatism. It was in Chicago that the neoclassical science of economy, popular at the time in the US, was married to the neoliberalism of Hayek and the ill through a subtle appendage. The introduction of advanced probability theory and Bayesian statistics through the emerging field of game theory. That the shadow of the future surfaced into economics as a numerical factor has directly to do with the chaotic feud with the Hayekian market unconscious. This unholy alliance between American econometrics itself an uncanny queen of cybernetics and socialist cybernetics projects, with the everyday neoliberal philosophy resulted in the contemporary monster child called neoliberalism, um, a mishmash of idealist battles over reformation. The everyday market theories were far more mystical and esoteric than today's industries of the future, insurance, hedging, forecasting, etc. The sciences of calculation of the future, borrowing their formulas from orthodox thermodynamics and classical physics, 
as many have noted before, are the rest of nature itself as the primary input of their forms of calculus. The rituals of measurement act as a self-fulfilling prophecies, act as self-fulfilling prophecies, congealing and totalizing the future as a reality, as something here and now, rather than placed within the territory of the unknowable. To loop something into existence is the shared modality of rituals and derivative instruments alike. The recursive movement between death and credit, while the constant flows of liquidity, spanning the gift and ritually organized societies till the present. The weird is also another word for looping. Timothy Morton writes, weird from the old North Urk, meaning twisted in a loop. The North entwine the web of fate with itself. In the term beer, there flickers a dark pathway between causality and aesthetic dimension, between doing and appearing, a pathway that dominant Western philosophy has blocked and suppressed. Two, Fisher further elaborates on the beard as a particular kind of anxiety. It involves a sensation of wrongness. A weird entity or object is so strange that it makes us feel that it should not exist, or at least it should not exist here. Yet if the entity or object is here, then the categories which we have up until now used to make sense of the world cannot be valid. The weird in this sense creates a rift in the models of thought or in categories of the old. Massive financial crisis of the past decades shaped the grounds of our forecasting model to reveal that they only apply as long as the context they arise from remains identical. Or as Eddie Ayas says, they are a change of context and that it is only relative to a given context that we can make causal predictions at all. In other words, capturing the end of the under capital in a fugitive glimpse at the moment of the stock market crash signals a change of context from one reality setting to another. As the threat of an imminent and immense illiquidity went to Van Beach, the invisible infrastructures of circulation are writ large. Marina Wishmet writes, crisis makes circulation visible. When circulation freezes, it becomes visible. And lastly, number three, the weird as a sense of being haunted by a foreign agency. Who or what is it that cannot or will not explain what it is doing or why it is doing it? Or as Martin Corning says, why do we keep doing this? Why do we keep offering up our surplus? The absence of the puppet master that works through us turns us into ruins. Discussing the ruins of the colony and the function of memory, Ashim Amanda writes, in certain canonical black texts, the colony appears foremost as a site of loss, which in turn makes it possible to demand that the ex-colonizer pay a debt to the ex-colonized. The weird is a glitch, a form of ontology required to bring us into the waking life of our bodies as reserves of death. So these three descriptions of the weird help me locate derivative politics that are separate from or take advantage of instruments currently in the service of predatory practices of future extraction that are exemplified by finance. If the end of capital cannot be imagined before the end of the world, as many have cited and repeated, um, maybe we should imagine the end of the world as a precondition for the end of capital. The climate catastrophes that come in our limited experience that can orient us towards modes of financial activism that can go along other strategies of refusal or compromise. What's at stake is pursuing forms of justice-seeking activism that work through our current economic systems, trying to forge a politics of mutual indebtedness with the shift from the individual to the individual subject of finance. Individual, um, I would explain here, is uh, related to as a house is dissected and reassembled into a bundle of collateral debt obligations, 
a body and its cognitive capacities is dissected and partitioned into part-time job obligations. Um, so we have moved from the individual subject to a whole new territory. As sociologist and dancer Randy Martin says, creating the world in the image of commodities made it possible to imagine what it would mean to take collective possession of the means of production. Recognizing the world crafted through the operations of derivatives leads towards the entangled constitution of mutual indebtedness, of the ways that we are social together even if we never fuse as one. This is the essence of what we are trying to exercise at weird economies, as I said in admittedly very abstract terms, as much as it can be condensed in a short presentation. Um, we are still an infant of a project in Silicon Valley terms, still in the beta version. Um, but in the spirit of indebtedness, I will end on sharing a few of our inspirations in thinking about the politics of debt and forms of financial activism that can be relevant for um, all our practices. Recent financial philosophies and radical practices have pointed out possibilities to use the techniques of finance to subvert and reverse finance's own tendency to widen the accumulative effects of past racial, colonial, and economic injustice. In regards to the formation of new political subjectivities, Michel Ferrer describes practices of counter-speculation or speculative insurgency in the current reputational regime. More specifically, he describes this program to be the political work of investing and raising the credit, credit worthiness of discredited subjects and forms of knowledge. In a social realm entirely predicated on a reputational regime and politics of credibility, how can the art system lend itself to social experimentations around theories of financial justice? A campaign like Strike MoMA, or similar cases as they happen in the UK, which targets the toxic philanthropy of the museum's leadership, is a good case in point of such investing activism in the field of art. Building on the past instances of museum boycotts and strike campaigns in the US, and elsewhere, Strike Moma works on changing the image of what's previously taken as reputable and credible engagement with art institutions. Or as Ferrer says, far from sacrificing substance to symbolism or concentrating on symptoms to the detriment of structural inequalities, these movements reckon with the fact that the allocation of moral, social, and financial credit has become the decisive state of social struggles. Robert Meister's theorization of historical justice and reparations as a financial option is another option. He writes, capitalism is an injustice compounding machine that must be reprogrammed in order to channel its virtualized form of wealth into social value, which is currently held hostage to the maintenance of the machine itself. We must thus reverse the discipline of payments by extracting, by exacting a price from finance for the injustice it perpetuates. The price of justice at the times of economic crisis, according to Meister, is the price of the liquidity premium that governments pay to pay financial institutions. That is to delay the option of revolution. Uh, and I'll just pause here for the. No, no, you Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you very much, I'll give the floor to you. So one of the great things that's happened during the pandemic is doing these things on Zoom for two years is I think our level of comfort <laughs> has gone up because, you know, I should be at home. I can, you know, like, not have shoes on, and I can turn my camera off and go make tea and pat my dog when I'm stressed out, etc. So now I'm demanding a different light. Thank you very much, Tom and team. Thank you so much for the amazing team of Nottingham Contemporary. Thank you for all the negotiations that we underwent in order for me to be here, which are a big part of my practice. So, um, I'm going to read. I'm going to read 
read something from um, a new work that was coming out in this book. This book, this amazing book, <laughs> Material Kinship Reader, edited by Chris Bettel and Clementine Edwards, which is coming out next month, which considers material beyond extraction and kinship beyond the nuclear family. Published by Onomatopoeia Press next month and available for pre order now uh, and available on the editors of Britain in all good UK art bookshops next month. Alongside this story um, that I'm going to share from this beautiful publication, features text by some of my kind of heroes and inspirations such as Robin Wall Kimmerer, Michelle Murphy, and Anna Le Guin, as well as many more. And I'm really honoured to be counted amongst them as authors as well as to share some of this work with you today. So the text consists of a speculative story and then an author's note about the speculative story. And I'll talk more about that format a bit later and we can unpack it a bit in the Q&A. But for today, I'm only going to read you a short extract of the story and then focus more on the author's note. And we can also talk about that. So the story, what we stay for, thinks with a future off-world uh, colony, a series of two colonies on a planet, um, two kind of factions from this Earth have gone off and created these two colonies on this planet and they don't speak to each other. And the colonies were began with completely different ontological um, founding principles or different kinds of demographics of off-Earth worlders. And the first uh, colony that I will read from is called Sumud. And the second colony, which I will not read from, but we'll talk about, is called Autopoiesis. So the story kind of flips between these two um, protagonists, Nahertia, who is in Autopoiesis, and Kusuak, who lives in Sumud. And they don't really talk about each other apart from occasionally as the other colony. But they do talk about their life, really, their, their life and what they strive for and, and what they believe in. Kusuat, Sumud. I absolutely loathe sweeping time. Although it symbolizes a physical action, it's really become more like a season. And even though everyone's got to do it, it, also, it always feels personal. This year, sweeping time coincides with my mood time and a deep ache already throbbing through my flimsy biceps from yesterday's sweeping is being echoed in my abdomen and in my upper thighs. But no one gets out of it. We do it together as a community, and that's non-negotiable. To make matters worse, Lahale, my sister, is giggling stupidly and making eyes at Petrana across the street, as though this is some kind of ancient courting ritual, rather than a preemptive precaution to and reminder of genocide. Every time I look at her, all I hear is the thump, thump, moan, moan of them having sex yesterday, and it's not helping my crack. I'd give anything to be tucked up in my warm sleeper at home, just me and my ambidextrous left hand. It's always something like this. The ash brings bad luck. When Samud was seeded two generations ago, the ash storms were a thing of novelty. We didn't even know what they were. Our people just assumed some kind of natural phenomena. We understood so little about the planet then. The other colony had only been around a hundred years. Not that we'd ever had any contact. We came here following a different dream. One that, unlike theirs, did not preclude our survival. Our ancestors knew the ash wasn't snow because it wasn't cold and it didn't melt and the tests came back saying there were no water compounds. And by the end of winter, it had started to fall black. As some would have seasons so similar to the more extreme regions of Earth, they assumed the spring rains would simply wash the ash away. So the people left it where it lay, coating the streets and houses and tools and bicycles, the window frames and door hinges. That's how my baba told it, just like that. When the sun returned one year, she would say, making her eyes wide and tickling the air in a parody of dawn. All in a moment, the ash began to soften, becoming springy and gelatinous to the touch. 
Lehele and I would gather closer, lifting our faces to scent the familiar story. That night, we to have one last breath of defiance and a thrust star over the land in a silent, bone-aching rush. In the morning, when the callers came to open up their window, or the risers tried to leave their homes, they found the ash had frozen into a hard lacquer, as thin as my hand, but harder than space iron. Here my mother would pause for dramatic effect. No one could get out. When I was little, I was so scared I almost cried and had to be pulled into the safety of Baba's lap and the shawl of a thousand colours. Shh, just a shh, you would hush, even as the story went on, unwinding in ribbons of sorrow, gently teaching me that that comfort doesn't end the pain of truth, only makes it a little more bearable. People were locked in their rooms and compounds, she whispered, and had to be broken out by melting the strange evil substance with very hot tongues of flame. But in their anger, the fire too became enraged by the fight against the melted ash, and several houses caught alight and could not be put out. Others died years later from inhaling the fumes of the blaze. Sometimes Baba would cough dramatically at this point. And when I was really small, I cried, thinking she too would soon be stolen away by this silent, invisible killer. Worst of all, Baba went on, even over my muffled sobs, when almost everyone had been saved and were climbing out of their windows or squeezing through the gaps of doors they couldn't close, everything else in the city began to die. Unlike a natural ash that fertilizes land and brings life, this ash settled and got into everything. When it melted, it stuck, and when it froze, it became impenetrable so that all the plants died and nothing could be grown or harvested. Life tends towards life, reciprocity, balance. Life is concerned with the inside, with how we live together. And the ash has offered us nothing but death. It kills our land, my Baba laments and thus the hearts of our people. So eventually, we had to leave. Here she trailed off, some of her own fire burning as low as the story. We had to leave our home, and leaving is not a thing our people do readily, especially not here, when we have already forsaken the homeland. Then Mama would tell Baba that was enough, and she should sit back and drink some tea, but I never got tired of her story. I wish she was here now, She'd slap the Halle silly for her nonsense and maybe even roll me up some of her special dried leaves, which she smoked when her bones ached too much, after which she would spend the rest of the night wide-eyed dreaming. Now we live here in the second Sumud, here even further from the hinterland between us and the other city, the ash doesn't fall so heavily. Sometimes I look out there toward the western horizon and imagine I can see the jagged skeleton of my recent ancestor's home. Baba always remembered it, and her memories have kept the fear alive in my heart every year when the ash storm comes and we try to sweep them away. I still hate sweeping time, even though everyone comes out toward the end of winter to the, brush the ash to the, to the edge of each community and finally to the outskirts of the city. There, they say, for I haven't seen it, a wall is slowly forming of the treacherous stuff. I wonder if it is keeping something out, or keeping us in. I wonder if it hates us the way the other city must hate us, for they must know we are here. Or maybe it's even worse than that. Maybe they just don't care. So throughout the story, we see, and I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit about what you call this. I'm not going to read from it. Autopoetis is this um, utopic, uh, post-everything city, right? So we're kind of in a post-capitalist, post-gender, post-racial, utopic space where everything is built up of this material called neoplastic. And the people are really obsessed with this neoplastic when they eat it, it's medicine, it's their architecture, they even name their pronouns after this neoplastic. Kind of become this 
um, this this godlike material. And the Hertzia is an NPE, a, a, um, a neo plastics ergonomic scientist, and it's Plaza's. So burnout, it's Plaza's job to try and think about how to grow this city. And the city was set off with this um, finite amount of neoplastics. This is how much you've got, that's it, you're on your own, there's no coming back to Earth, you don't know if Earth is still here, this is it. And these neoplastics were built with the intention that the city would grow to a certain size and then it would be stuck. So Nahatsik says the scientists of Earth were so kind of traumatized by what this massive growth catalyst world had done and how we killed the earth that they were like humans can't be trusted with growth so we have to give them a finite amount and they have to make it work but of course in this in this uh, post growth colony people still want more people are in love with this world they believe they've kind of overcome all oppression and they and they've kind of um yeah thought beyond the need that some have to sacrifice for the plentifulness of the Right, so now it's plentifulness to everyone. And they think there's nothing else here on this planet. They, some of them know about the other colonies, some of them don't. So she's uh, has is trying to find a way to kind of trick the uh, makeup of these neoplastics to expand. And you know, I, I have so much love for Nahansia and, and gorgeous voice. I mean, it's this super pro, pro pleasurable place. There's this gorgeous spice market, and there are these beautiful kind of like intimate sexual like parlors where they go and they have these inebriating neoplastic shots of like, I don't know, jelly drugs that take you into these super amazing psychotic spaces. They have neoplastic augmentation. It's amazing. Um, but I remain very questioning of this idea that there can be this utopic space without um, there being a backlash. And of course, the backlash in this story is that the ash that is falling on this other colony is coming off of the neoplastic. So this is straight into this ash, which is blowing, blowing, and blowing far away from its water oasis, and they believe it's being dissolved in, into harmless kind of particles, but actually it's, it's accumulating and, and, and has destroyed the entire city and is still kind of contaminating the lungs and, and, and likely good chances of this, this other problem. So I wrote this author's note. I'm going to read it first, and I'll say what I wrote. Author's note. The term autopoiesis, from Greek auto, self, and poesis, creation, production, refers to a system capable of reproducing and maintaining itself by creating its own parts and eventually further components. Quote. If we don't demand radical change, we are headed for a whole world of people searching for a home that no longer exists. Edward Said helps us imagine what that might look like. He helps to, pop he helps to popularize the Arabic word sumud, to stay put, to hold on. That steadfast refusal to leave one's land despite the most desperate eviction attempt, and even when surrounded by continuous danger. The thing about fossil fuels is they are so inherently dirty and toxic that they require sacrificial people and places, people whose lungs and bodies can be sacrificed to work in the coal mines, people whose land and water can be sacrificed to open pit mining and oil spills, end quote. And that's the Naomi Klein's Edward Said lecture, <coughs> which I really recommend if you haven't seen it, you can watch it online or read the transcript. What we stood for is in many ways a result of my grappling with certain queer reclamations and engagement with plastic and plasticity, particularly within canons of post-humanism, queer theory, and feminist academic thought and writing. These theoretical and lab-based experiments into hormone rebalancing as proponents of or invitations to think through plastic as kin in a new feminist cyborg embodied society or post-racialized, post-gendered, post-bio reproductive society, have always felt to me at once enticing, like a world or a future from dreams, or an Ursa Caleb Wynn novel I'm still trying to understand, yet one I'm decidedly excluded from. 
had spent several years and months in the lead up to writing this piece, more intensively thinking through where that sense of exclusion comes from. The simple answer is that my strongest, most intimate and embodied relationships with plastic are of being surrounded by, drinking from, reliant on, immersed in, and infiltrated by its burning scent in a craft during my childhood. The caustic vibrations of that city make it feel in many ways like it is run on and even built on plastic bags. They clog up gutters and drains, they burn and heat on every street corner and field, and are dumped not only in the Atlantic Ocean, so that every beach is almost as much plastic as sand, but also in vast micro cities of scrap, plastic, and e waste, on which underage hustlers scavenge and repurpose copper wiring and the plastic throwaways of neoliberal technological and capitalist progress. The original recycling bar, and much of our recycling, still ends up. Um, in those micro cities. In other words, I have yet to read an engagement with the potentiality of plastics that is able to exceed that which Naomi Klein calls the sacrificial dungeons of climate colonialism, nor do these engagements exceed an anthropocentric white savior complex that views the racialized body as always already other, always already animal. And I really want to. I'd love to. I, I want to buy into the fantasies of the plasticity, neither concerned with my survival nor predicated on my death. These notions are further complicated by what I experience as a truly heartfelt attempt at and belief in the potential for these futures to do precisely the opposite. These, let's call them theoretical post humanist world builders are, like Mahertzia, true believers in a dream I could get behind if it wasn't quite so shiny. In Accra and in many globalizing and or gentrifying sites, and remains problematic because the word globalizing, we can talk more about it. Uh, and in many of the globalizing and or gentrifying sites blackness navigate, shiny often means skyscrapers filled with washing machines and dishwashers for expats and upper classes in a city without consistent running water. Irony is endless. It means Apple Mac computers at three times market price, whose copper wiring ends back up in our micro cities, and stolen iPhones whose aluminum components are extracted by means of ecocidal dams that displace black and indigenous communities across the Atlantic. It means a dream we are being sold on the backs of our oppression, a dream that I would argue was never meant for us racialized, colonized, sacrificial people. It was only meant to keep us busy. And of course, this is the dream of growth, of capitalism. Of course, these sacrificial spatialities, like chemical toxicities themselves, do not play by the rules of colonial borders. These sacrificial zones and peoples leak. In London, as well as, as, well as other cities across, the West, across Western Europe and Northern America, Traffic dense highways, airports, additional runways, and chemical production storage facilities are built in locations largely populated by racialized, racialized and migrant peoples, increasing the mental and physical health risks among the communities least resourced and supported by the state and sociality at large. White middle and upper class and gentrifying areas are cleaned up to protect the bodies, minds, and children of colonialism's legacy. So while plastic remains in some ways an inescapable reality across our species, we know now that micro and nanoplastic particles are can be found in human organs all over the world, in breast milk, everywhere, in water, that reality does not hit us all the same, and not all of our lives and deaths matter. If that is to say that the technologies through which black life often encounters and engages with plastic are ones, are ones of toxicity, refuse, and sacrifice. What's more, this fascination with the queer potentialities of plastics, much like, much like feminist conjurings of cyborgs and post-human futures, seem to unknowingly gesture towards utopias predicated on the continued disavowal of violent colonial histories and the cosmologies they attempted to eradicate, as well as the continued sacrifice of black bodies. It is in particular this turn toward unknowing or unseen, or that which Naomi Klein calls consistently turning away, 
even while dialects of intersectionality and decolonization save the tongues and ears of our allies, that renders a neoliberal white feminist fascination with plastic futures so pervasive, enticing, and deadly. Like plastics themselves, a silent killer, all shiny, brightly colored, and trussed up in a bow. I might gesture instead towards Akia Imran Jackson's work on the plasticity of blackness, or on getting you to visual ideation of more than human assemblages that might indeed include plastics, to Michelle Murphy's decolonial cancer cells and plastic refuse, or to Vanessa Adlon Jones's work on the queer hormonal relations of bodies and sand in post colonial Martinique, or even to DA Zoli Inspires. Paracito plastics, which imagines a future in which plastic particles in the ocean have found one another and become conscious. In the speculative work above, I try to think with the possibility of plastics, even while contesting the violent processes of categorization that the human was formulated upon. And I keep going back and back to this in my work, even though in many ways it's a 1980s throwback, because I don't think that this idea or this um, truth that how we think about the human, or how many of us think about the human, is, is very much a formulated concept that has served very particular economic, social, and political roles in the social consciousness of post Enlightenment thought. The process of post humanism, of outliving anthropocentrism, cannot be disposed of, outgrown, or left behind until we are able and willing to truly deconstruct and disassemble the colonial global political systems that bore it into being for the sole purpose of power over whatever the cost of profit, whatever the sacrifice. That human cannot be disposed of until we're not willing to leave this land and understand that we cannot save it until we focus not only on the molecular deconstruction of the material that seemingly cannot be unmade, but on the violent molecular, molecular deconstructions of a system and a peoples that made it, and lean always and lean always towards more, without wondering what more might mean. So the reason why I chose to read from the author's note and a little bit of the story, rather than reading just from the story, and you know, I'm a science fiction writer, I'm incredibly invested in the medium and mode of story as uh, and both a kind of more accessible, I think, than academic writing, way of engaging political, social, ontological, cosmological ideas and ways of being. Um, so the both, yes, both, in, both more accessible and, and in some ways, I think, more capacious. I think you can tell more complex and nuanced stories sometimes through storytelling than you can through um, article writing or academic writing. But this kind of interesting trend that um, I suppose we'll be researching, because nothing is new, of leaning into the speculative, whether that's through Afrofuturism or indigenous futurism or Asian futurism or um, speculative futurism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to kind of project our consciousness into the future has become a little bit too safe for me, particularly in the contemporary art world. I received I mean, I created about seven different worlds over the course of 2020 into early 2021. The response to that wave of Black Lives Matter protests was quick, let's get lots of black artists and think about the future. Right, let's pay them to think about the future. And, then, and in some ways, you know, that was great. It was great to get those commissions, it was great to be thinking about the future, but it also became increasingly problematic and really itched under my skin because it felt like a way to avoid thinking about the present, a way to avoid doing the work in the present that would start moving us towards those futures that, that me and some of my um, colleagues who work on speculative thinking were, were trying to think about manifesting. So in this um, aftergrowth, post-capitalist imaginary symposium, it felt really important, yes, I see you, thank you, it felt <laughs> really important to return to, return to the work and return to kind of questioning what are leaning in towards, um, towards, I suppose, like thinking post, right, thinking and imagining post is, and to think about those kind of 
what are those impulses in us? What makes it so difficult to stay with the present? We know what makes it so difficult to stay with the present, right? To keep talking about it, to keep talking about our complicity, to keep talking about our entanglement, to keep looking back at the past and the histories that have still not been acknowledged or discussed or disseminated, you know, not even adequately, but at all in many parts of this country. But to kind of stay with that and to use some of these speculative tools to help us stay with that and to think of that together. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank you both for the absolutely brilliant uh, presentations. Incredibly rich and uh, complex and, and you know, amazing ways of thinking about speculation, fiction, the future, and different possibilities of intervening in the economy. I wanted to perhaps start by asking a question, going back to Bahar's presentation, and um, just to kind of recap a little bit really quickly, um, your work on world economies kind of allows us to reformulate, rethink the economy in a wider, uh, within a wider framework, a, a broader kind of notion that overlaps with neoliberalism's modes of uh, speculation and future making. And you know, it allows us to understand fiction as well. Um, and I, I was very much intrigued by one part of your presentation where you talked about the colony as a site of dispossession and loss, uh, building on Mendes uh, uh, articulation, which required a different type of economic engagement. Right? So if, you know, the colony kind of dispossessed, uh, then we need a different mode of thinking about debt. And, and uh, I wanted to ask you how would you link that part, like that kind of necropolitics uh, that is involved in financial capitalism and neoliberalism, with the, what, you, what you call the, the individual, with you know, this part of our contemporary beings, or bodies, that is, not only bodies, but all our capacities that are split into different um, modes that can, be, can become sites of extraction or extractivism. So maybe I wanted to ask you about those two relationships. Thanks, that's a great question. I'm just trying to think it's sad, but I'm not sure if I can fully really develop a, a great answer. But um, I'm very much indebted in thinking of indebtedness to um, a group of radical thinkers, philosophers like, like the late Randy Martin, who uh, they evoke this, you know, idea of the individual that uh, in our political imaginary has to substitute the kind of um, impasse that's, you know, that that the, the, the individual type of practice, um, and the individual allows for that collectivity while, you know, maintaining the separateness. That's you know, I think it's more and more becoming obvious that um, we require this kind of a, more of a complex political cognitive understanding of the world. Um, and it's also like related to the you know the, the long history of thinking about identity and non-identity and how um, political formation can happen as you know as as a type of identity that's not like essential, like an essentialist. Um, and I think this is generally the zone that I'm trying to move forward, move towards, and I know quite a lot of people who are thinking towards as how do you maintain in this regime that's completely inside, like, you know, all the speculative, experimental potentialities into its exploitative, extractive mechanisms. How can you maintain something that's Open something that not that's not essential, though. and you know we have like great inheritance of feminist queer that you know I think Emma was uh, discussing that also that are thinking about non-essential and non-essential forms of thinking about um, political life today, but it's very it's pretty much like when you move to the zone of economics and economic thought like. Um, it seems like you know those conversations haven't really happened yet, and specifically in the 2008 uh, crisis, like, the first figure that's uh, you know um, put on the pedestal 
is speculation itself. So there's the spirit of the you know counter speculative, um, counter speculative in a very kind of like broad and general sense of understanding um, financialization that becomes the, the kind of modus operandi of like. Um, financial activism. So these figures are trying to reinsert back something of an idea of a non-essentialist thinking of economy of value that are present in many other forms of thinking um, that have to be, you know, inserted back into the system. I didn't quite answer to the um, the uh, quote, but maybe it's it's enough for now. I'll go back to it. Brian, yeah, thanks a lot, and uh, I'm going to ask you a question now, and maybe we can pick up on that uh, because it may be related. This question, so like, um, I mean, as we talked and, and argued for uh, vulnerable writing, which uh, elaborates an effective and queer engagement in the face of environmental catastrophe, and uh, in this brilliant that you, uh, the fragments that you wrote, there's a range of different um, elements that kind of in truth, in a weird way, in a weird manner, the, the kind of presence uh, of colonies, that, that, you know, the planetary colonies, such as the snow, uh, the ash, and, and, and all of this, and they're existing in the backdrop of a genocide, somehow, right? And that kind of relationship uh, is always there, and I'm thinking about the Mendes uh, book there. But I wanted to ask you, in relation to these frameworks of genocide and death, that you know, like climate colonialism ends up somehow projecting onto the global south in a very uneven manner. Um, I wanted to ask you what the role of uh, fiction is in relation to, to this. What, you know, because if speculation is both uh, um, kind of the material of finance and fiction, how do we how do you deal with this within your work? Or I mean, that's a bit more about. Um, yeah, what I'm asking uh, a lot. I think I think in some ways it's a question about positionality, right? Because um, I'm British, I was born here, and my father is Ghana, and I spent like much of my childhood in Ghana. It's moving back and forth, um, but I am diasporic, and I have the privilege of of a British passport and I currently live and work anyway in the UK and in the British Academy, Academy in the art space, right? So this kind of, there's a new wave of, oh, we need to really like help people across like the global south and think about, and speculate and think about their future, right? Because they're not doing it, because they live, they live stuck in the present, because they're impoverished, um, you know, like, I mean, for example, in Ghana we might talk about chop today culture, which means I'm thinking about how I'm going to feed my family today, right? But then that's oversimplified in the West, and people think, oh, well, Ghanaians are only ever thinking about, or Africans or Black are only ever thinking about what they're going to eat tonight. They don't have imagination. <laughs> so we need to, like, build frameworks so they can speculate. Um, so I think, I think I what, I, what I love about this story is I try to think speculation differently across, like, a different temporal framework, right? So when we're talking about like moving away from pro progress and growth, we immediately, if, if, this, if you're in reading kind of Anna Singh and, and people writing around this in relation to climate change, you start hearing about um, non-linear temporalities, right? Circular temporality. So this idea that many peoples across the world have and still do not think about time linearly, right? They do not necessarily think about a past that has happened, a present that is now, and a future. We think about time in a, in a more circular or a, a more interdependent way, and we can think about that as kind of black time, indigenous time, etc. So I think in this text, the colony of Sumud understands that in order to, to survive, it needs to hold on to and cherish its past. They have not moved to this off-world colony in order to create a post-colonial society, right? One in which we've been freed from the sins of colonialism. They want to kind of hold on to everything, all the trauma and the pain of what they were, and 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 but that's not all of it, right? Like the Hunter sisters still like messing around during this kind of song event with like 
her lover, and it's all, you know, they have sex, and they have to deal with sibling rivalries, and all that stuff. I mean, life goes on, right? So I think I try to hold together that different way of thinking about the speculative, which is not projecting into a future that is, that is separate from the present and the past. And that, for me, is, is an African way of thinking about the future. And then in contrast, you have this kind of, I, and I think it's fear. I think it's a deep, desperate um, fear of reckoning with our past. As British people, as English people, as white people, as still colonial people, uh, colonizing people, um, and a kind of desperate running towards the speculative, right? So I think, I think in that way, it's also for me, whilst I'm, at least once I'm here, to work with how the speculative can function as a decolonial tool, is to shift how we think about crime, how we think about accountability, and to sit with those, um, um, what's the word, uh, discrepancies or like, um, I can't think of the word, things that don't make sense that still work together, right? There's cognitive dis dis dissonances. So I think in the way that speculative allows us to think, hold those difficult things together that we don't necessarily have the languages or the rituals to do, particularly in this country, because we don't like all the difficult things at all, let alone together. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Or at least an attempt at how I'm thinking about the question. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I mean, I have more questions, but I perhaps wanted to open up to, to see if anyone wants to ask any questions in public. Does anyone have any burning, urgent questions? Just one question. Thank you very much for those the stimulating thoughts. I, I became involved with a group of people that, who were speculative engineers. So they worked for a company called Lucas Aerospace and they were tasked with making missiles and aircraft parts. Okay? And they were all going to be sacked because they were no longer useful. So they, organising in the trade unions, got together and speculated on an alternative future as engineers, practicing engineers. And they came up with a whole set of different things that they could do with their skills. So they came up with a notion, so they ended up with a theory that they were actually involved in socially useful production. So instead of blowing the world up, they were going to rebuild the world to allow people to live. But I think in the process of doing that, they weren't aware of their creative faculties. They were looking to save their jobs. It's only 40 years on, and these same people look back at what they were doing. They realise that they gained some deep insight into the crazy world in which we all live. And they're still burning with a passion for this insight and for this... Uh, this uh, self actualization is uh, actually, you know, they, they've become theoreticians, like philosophers, that, but from an engineering background. And it struck me that <clears throat> linking that sort of speculative engineering with the sort of creative art ideas that you, you, you put forward, that could be a really powerful force for bringing this uh, a different uh, a world after growth, a livable after growth. I mean, just to the expand on top of what you said, I think this is also um, why I think it's important to insist on, you know, post-disciplinarity at this time in terms of what creativity means, because it's definitely not only the professional artistic class in in the good or in the bad way that are you know, creative. So, um, I see quite a lot of interesting radical political projects like starting in spaces that you wouldn't have imagined like, you know, maybe 40, 50 years ago that would uh, be thinking through these you know, questions. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I just maybe maybe that's it. And also, like remembering that, like everything, like this, just the, the right to speculate is still somehow also become like an elite thing that only you know, whether it's artists or it's politicians or it's economic specialists. Um, that they have the right to speculate and everybody else is speculating all the time. There's also I mean, people who have like, nothing in the fridge are speculating all the time about how to turn it into a meme and they can do this or do that and how would that work. And you know, like I think it's also about kind of declassing and, and de eluting the idea of speculating amazing um, models everywhere on how to speculate. Because the art of growth is happening, right? Like not everybody is living in growth. Many people are living in decline. Many people, as we saw, you know, in the amazing presentation yesterday about the city of Jarry, many people are living in places where everybody has left, where their economies are in decline or have ended. You know, they are living in after growth already. Like that's happening in the present, and they're modeling how to survive that and how to rebuild and reframe that all the time. Is anyone have any? Other questions in the audience? Yeah, there's another question. Um, hello. Um, I asked this question previously, but since I work in um, I work in an art school as a lecturer. So I'd be really interested to hear both of your views on the role of the educational institution in speculating and whether we do that well at the moment or not. <laughs> and where I sit. Um, so I'd be really interested to hear your views on, on the role of the educational institution in speculating in, in the form that we've been talking about. Um, well, I'm going to speak from a kind of, uh, I mean, I teach, I'm a, I'm a teacher, I teach in universities, um, and I run workshops with all kinds of folks. And I have some amazing colleagues from workshops with young, very, very young and young people. You know? um, so I think there is a consistent intervention and interruption into, let's call it institutional education, traditional education institutions, um, which so often discourage speculation. I mean, we can even think like so often discourage questioning, so often discourage the imagination. Um, and not always, you know. I had a couple of phenomenal teachers who really shaped me. Um, there are so many amazing people who are doing that work. I would say I definitely feel like I'm battling my university institutions quite a lot to fight for the right for my students to be able to write differently, think differently, submit like submit work differently. But then I also have students who are like challenging me all the time, being like, "This isn't enough." You know, like you're still like pandering to the system in these ways, and we're already like 10,000 steps ahead of me. You want this radical change, and I'm like, okay, but we still live with it. So, I mean, I think it's, I think, again, I think it's happening all the time. I think what's frustrating is that it's happening in unsupported and isolated situations, right? It's one teacher, or it's a couple of teachers, or it's, you know, one after school club, and it's not usually not state, state resourced, and they're not in touch with each other. So those of us who are trying to interrupt, do this interrupting work, are consistently burned out and isolated um, and depressed, usually. It's, it's, it's depressing, and we can't always do the work we want to do for our students, and that's depressing all for ourselves. So I think that there's a lot of work to be done around the care, the care work, the kind of economies and ecologies of care and how we're connected, how we're talking to each other, how we're sharing resources and models, and how we're challenging each other because it's hard when you're always being challenged by the institution to continue challenging yourself, right, and, and learning and growing because everything feels like a fight. So I think building those kind of soft economies, care economies, in intersectional and accessible but critical and challenging ways, there's like a lot of work to be done around resourcing, really, it's around resourcing. Yeah, I mean, I have more of a broad answer, maybe. Um, my practice so it has been engaged with the pedagogy for many, many years, but I think it's kind of quintessential for everything 
but at the same time I moved to London for this PhD like three years ago, so I'm quite new to the context of educational institutions here. Um, but um, like what I observed, like maybe it's not only related to speculation or like imagination as like a content that can be inserted into education here, but um, this distinction between content versus economy of anything that we teach, um, which is very much related to everything we talked about, like what is the you know what is the economic. Um, infrastructure of all these practices, all these critical practices, critical thought. Um, like with what's happening with privatization to the universities, for example, or even broadly the hostile kind of immigration policies with everything. Like if, if you really want to think imaginatively about education in the UK, I would say in a completely, you know, um, utopian sense, which I wish it could be realistic, is the colony has to return, you know, resources to the colonizers. Like there shouldn't be any border policy on students who want to come. There shouldn't be like these astronomical, like international student fees um, for, you know, foreign students from certain countries. So you see what, you know, is slowly kind of like seeping into education here. So we are dealing with a very compromised system already. Um, and on top of that, we still need to like, rescue the system, kind of like NHS, because so this is the best we have, but it's compromised. Um, but yeah, I don't even know like, when we think about it in that sense where to begin, but it's uh, very much established from just what I'm observing in teaching and like, being a student myself. Thank you very much. I think we are kind of uh, approaching the end. Perhaps we have time for one more question from the audience. There's one question. Thank you. Thank you both of you really enlightening um, the talks. And I thought it was interesting how both of you um, are sort of challenging these deep uh, paradigms in society that they were, even though it's quite different. Um, I guess my question is regarding neocolonialism. Um, and I know that um, I'm arguing the creation of care economies and um, things like that, which are a sort of a, 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 a grassroots way of looking at values or changing the values um, to people. I guess my question is, and this is something that I grapple with a lot, is to what extent does this sort of bottom-up power, to what extent can this make a difference in the world where we are sort of facing you know, a big company, a, a British company that goes to Africa and set the oil pipeline, you know, as they still do, um, in what respect do we also need to think politically? I mean, I guess my question is to what, to what extent are you an anarchist and to what extent are you a sort of a, um, a politician who has to compromise and things, but, in order to get, in order to grab the reins of power, um, that would be, that would be to, to, to go to that, that eternal question. I'm sure the question is going to also grab the reins of power as well. Thank you. I didn't really think of that question, so I didn't hear it. Okay. Yeah, so, um, basically, um, so it was about, I guess, do we need to somehow compromise uh, in the way in which we, we engage with um, uh, practices, I guess, right, uh, in, in relation to colonialism, by like neocolonialism, the way in which we are contributing also to the process of neocolonialism. Please, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. But, I guess yeah. a part of the question was like, can we go in and can we like, can we change the system from inside, right? Like a part of the question, like the age-old question, which you know there's no answer. <laughs> like some people need to be inside and some people need to be outside is the answer to that question. But like I suppose it's also about scale, the question, and what scale are we affecting change, even though we're thinking fundament about fundamental systems change. In some ways we're working on small working in small scale, and I mean I believe it's small scale also. Um, 
Whereas the example was that you know, the British oil company can still go anywhere in the world pretty much they want and fill up a pipeline, which has a huge ramification, I guess. Is that, yeah? Should, do you want to, should I go ahead? Yeah, just settle again. Um, do you know, I had a thought to what you were speaking, but now it's gone away. I think, okay, I wanted to at first address the care economies because care economies are a lot of different things. Yes, in some ways they're about ground up, right? They're about um, organizing our own child's care and having political meetings and you know, uh, at family dinners as opposed to looking after the kids while the people who are not caregiving go off and have political meetings and politicizing the care, the family care. But for me, in my practice, care economies are also top down. They're also about demanding care from the institution. So a lot of the work that I do with black, black particularly black and, and, and LGBTQ, I plus POC and black and indigenous artists is around how much are you getting paid? Do they pick you up from the airport, from the station? Is your hotel in, you know, I was once dropped off at a hotel, uh, well, it wasn't dropped off, I was told to go to this hotel that was in a super far right, like, EDL area in Manchester, and I had no idea until my sister in law was in Manchester was like, you cannot stay there, you know, like, like I need to send someone to come and get you, and some horrendous things happened to me during that stay that endangered my life, and it was absolutely terrifying, and nobody had thought about what it meant, what that meant. So for me, that care economy is also practical and it's about saying this means this is not best practice, this is basic practice and we're going to bring this artist in and I work in the arts but this is true across the board with international speakers and everything if you're going to bring this person in, can you take care of them and that care extends beyond do they have water on the table when they can give a talk, right? So I think, and I think that actually the scale, whilst ephemeral in a lot of the work that we do, the scale will remain ephemeral and in some ways that's important because it's not about ticking boxes and proving to the Arts Council, well, 500 people came to my event and therefore 500 lives were changed, <laughs> right? Sometimes it's about five people came and maybe 500 what lives were changed, you know? And I don't know, like, over the course of 10 years. Um, whilst the kind of scale of our work, or at least my work, but I feel this from your work as well, can be more ephemeral in how we measure the outcome, how we measure value, how we measure success, um, there is something important about staying with the, the sustainable change that comes from making sure people are cared for because they are able to still be here. And I came to this work because suddenly when I turned 28, 29 and I reached a certain place in my career, I was being spoken to as if I was some kind of elder in this field. And that is because of the shocking numbers of black queer women artists that are still present in the British art scene. And when I say present, I mean either they're still working or I mean they're still alive. Because there is a huge amount of lost black women artists in the British scene, both in terms of life and both in terms of presence in the art world. And I had to reckon with how am I still gonna be here in 30, 40 years because I can't I can't keep engaging with the institutions in that way. It's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's for making me ill, right? So like in that way, I think the, the scale and ramifications of measuring that kind of care and measuring that kind of work and space to think pleasure will be together, space to imagine pleasure will be together where you don't have to like demand that you have the right pronouns on the door before you can even get into the room, which means that why would you be there thinking about pleasure with features together? Like I think the ramifications and the scale and measuring that progress can, if we can think differently about money and time, be just as effective as like working in PP until you're able to like maybe stop a pipeline from being installed or change the like labor value distribution of how that pipeline is set up. That's a brilliant way of framing the conversation. <laughs> I think I think that was yeah absolutely incredible. I want to thank both of our speakers and I want uh, you know, to ask you to join me. Thank you.